I broke into the business right in Tampa, Florida. I was playing in a rock and roll band for 10 years, um, trying to avoid a real job. We played real loud rock and roll music, and I think we were about the hottest band in the Tampa Bay area. Tampa Bay also happened to be a hotbed for wrestling. The same with New York and Minneapolis. It was one of the biggest hotbeds. So all the wrestlers were around. I was a big wrestling fan. And there was a huge mystique with the wrestlers back then. They were very um, protective of the business. And if you said it was fake or if you told the guys, you know, nice show tonight, they'd punch you in the face. It was very different 20 years ago. And all of a sudden, these wrestlers started coming into the clubs I was playing because, like I said, we had the hot rock and roll band. The mystique wore off. I started talking with them. The next thing I knew, I started asking about the wrestling business because I was a fan. And before I knew it, I was at the... Tampa Armory, they call the Sportatorium, working out, trying to break into the wrestling business my first day, and after they exercised me to death where I was ready to faint, and I was seeing white, and my knees were buckling, they got me in the ring, and uh, Hiro Matsuda broke my leg. That's how I got in the wrestling business. I did not get a pair of boots from Santa. It wasn't easy. A lot of trials and tribulations. The first problem was money. Um, working so many times in one week. 10, 11, 12, 13, 14 times a week, sometimes twice a day. If you're taping TV, they'd want you to wrestle three or four times to get you on three or four tapes. At the end of the week, it translated into 100 bucks or $125 for all that work. Needless to say, there wasn't enough money for food, shelter, training, vitamins, and even beer. So uh, my buddy, Ed Leslie, who started out with me, he later became Brutus Beefcake. We used to live in my van. So for the first couple of years, we'd sleep in the van in the local parking lot of the deli or the bar or the apartment complex we could find and wake up in the morning, rush to the nearest gas station, brush our teeth and uh, go to the restroom. And it was kind of tough at first. And it took a couple of years of living in, in the van to get to the point where we got enough respect, we knew the trade well enough, we could make four or $500 a week. Um, to get into an apartment or get into a hotel. And even back then, you know, 20 years ago, four or $500 sounds like a lot of money, but it's not when you're on the road traveling and hotels and gas and cars breaking down. So it was tough at first, but you know, uh, the strong survived and we made it through the original tough times in the beginning. The Hulk Hogan character is, is impeccable if we're talking about the character. Um, it's much better than the man Terry Balea, which is me. Um, it's the the best of the best of all the positive characters, and it was it was it was kind of stumbled upon. Um, I started out wrestling around the Pensacola, Florida area, Georgia, Alabama area, and I happened to go stumble into a talk show to promote Mobile, Alabama, a local talk show, and Lou Ferrigno happened to be there. As I sat next to him on the set, um, you know. Everything worked out great. When I went back to the dressing room last night, all the guys in the dressing room said, my God, you're bigger than Lou Frigno, the Incredible Hulk. So they started calling me Terry the Hulk Boulder. So the Hulk name kind of was sneaking into my stage name, Terry Boulder. Um, as time went on, uh, I was wrestling as a good guy after I quit the wrestling business two or three different times because I wasn't making enough money. I kept going back to it, hoping I'd do better. The second or third time I quit, uh, Vince McMahon Sr. called me. And when I went to New York to talk to him about wrestling in the big arenas and the Madison Square, Martian, Square Garden promotion, he was real ethnic oriented, or oriented. And he had Pedro Morales, uh, Bruno San Martino for the Italian Americans, Chief J. Strongbow uh, for the Indian Americans, Ivan Putsky for the Polish type Americans. And he goes, I want you to be Hogan. Okay, Hogan, why? of course, for the Irish Americans, so it was Hulk Hogan. And the character as Hulk Hogan has always been a very positive character, the training, the prayers, and the vitamins, whether it was from the small promotions in the beginning with Terry the Hulk Bowler all the way to Hulk Hogan, the Madison Square Garden promotions have always been very popular. The name Hollywood Hogan came into play about 1994 when the ratings started flattening out when Hulk Hogan would go on TV, you'd watch the quarter hours instead of the numbers jumping up when I came on this TV. They kind of flattened out and it was because after seeing the shirt being ripped off for 15 years and the leg drop being ripped off for 15 years in America and the temperature of the wrestling business was kind of tired of it. Even my wife got tired of seeing the shirt ripped off. So I did the momentum shifting change and I said the training, the prayers and the vitamins, I did it for the money. 
in that Hollywood Hogan bad guy persona, holier than thou, better than you, my blood in my veins is better than yours. I body slam Hollywood <clears throat> with all my B movies, um, the same way I body slam the wrestling business. So the bad guy character of Hollywood Hulk Hogan came into place. As far as people that hate, had great matches were, there were Andre the Giant, there was Paul Orndorff, there were people like Roddy Piper, but you didn't come out the same way you went in. I would go in there to work with Paul Orndorff, and he was so physical, and he would kick me in the back of the head and in the face so hard, I would come out swollen and beat up to, uh, to where it was hard to get out of bed the next day. When I would wrestle Andre the Giant, for the first seven or eight years, he didn't like me very much. He was very protective of his big man aura, or the big man territory. And I was trying to be a big man and trying to be a main eventer and trying to follow in his footsteps. I admired him so much, but he took it as a threat. And he used to take his open hand, and his little finger was twice as big as my thumbs put together. This guy was a real giant. Sometimes he was up near 700 pounds, depending on his diet and how much he drank and ate. And I mean, when he would hit you, I mean, it was, it was brutal. I just molded my style. The Hulk of a persona is the ultimate good guy. The McDonald's, Chevrolet, America, California, broadband, USA, the California tan, Venice Beach is a certain mystique with California, USA, it's the land of opportunity. The Golden State, at the time, before it was jaded, you know, um, it was a wholesome place to, you know, be from. That projected and that transcended my whole character, Hulk Hogan from Venice Beach, California, Americana all the way. Um, it basically carried me through my career. Well, if I was a wrestling fan, I thought about Hulk Hogan's career. You know, there's a couple moments that come to pass that are the most memorable moments of all times. For the old fans, the baby boomers who grew up with me, they definitely remember WrestleMania 3, or even WrestleMania 1 with Mr. T, but more than that, WrestleMania 3 with 94,000 people body slamming Andre the Giant. If you missed that era or if you weren't alive back then, the baby boomers came back this year, you know, in 2002, and they brought their kids with them. And the kids and even the baby boomers might remember WrestleMania 18 where I wrestled The Rock. And nobody predicted that the biggest superstar in this business, The Rock, who was on TV every week, was a household name, had major motion pictures coming out, would stand in the ring with what they would call an old timer and get booed out of the building. There were 70,000 people in the Sky Dome that wanted Hulk Hogan to win. And even though the WWE didn't have me come out on top on the match, I won my fans back. So it was a situation that was just lopsided, and you would have to remember that. If I could be remembered as a guy that helped change wrestling and transcend wrestling into entertainment instead of this very barbaric beer-drinking cigar-smoking level, that's all I need. You know, I don't have to re be remembered as the greatest wrestler ever or, you know, the guy that saved the world. Just, just you know, if they could just give me those type of props. I mean, that's bigger than anything anybody could ask for. That's that's a big ego trip if somebody, you know, 100 years from now could say Hulk Hogan was the Muhammad Ali or the Babe Ruth of wrestling. That's huge. You know, I don't even know if I deserve that, but that'd be a nice way to be remembered. You know something, dude? You're facing the greatest wrestler of all times, Hulk Hogan, brother. So all I got to say is I hope you've trained, said your prayers, and eaten your vitamins. Because I'm taking no mercy. I'm not going to give you any quarter, brother. So what you going to do when the greatest wrestler of all times runs wild and destroys you? What you going to do? <sighs> if I had to pick one person out of everyone who helped me get to where I am today in this business, I mean, there's no, no question who it would be. It would be Vince McMahon. As a businessman, he's black and white. Um, on a personal level, he'd go a million, million miles for you on a personal level. He's the one that gave me the opportunity. He's the one that when I got lazy, would kick me in the butt. He's the one that when I got lazy, would talk in my ear. He's the one that really said, look over there, there's the vision, you can achieve it. Without him, uh, I never would have uh, had the success in this business. He's the single one person. Even to this day, if I infringe on his friendship on a personal level, a lot of people don't understand this. You can actually make mistakes. You can actually abuse Vince McMahon, not intentionally. You can actually go above and beyond the bounds of what a friendship are on a personal level. And this guy understands human beings. Um, that's why he's where he's at. Not on a business level. Some people say he's too aggressive. 
Some people say he'll do anything to win. That's all true, but that makes him a good businessman. Well, the popularity and the celebrity status that comes along with pro wrestling is a given. Once you're seen on TV, the public owns you. And you have to go through several stages. You have to be, first off, aware that it's happening and know how to handle it. You have to adjust to it and get used to it. And then the final stage is, you know, thank God it's happening to me. Thank God it's still happening. Um, everybody that's on TV, their lives change. And once you're on TV as a wrestler, you, you're not allowed a private life anymore because you owe the fans. I mean, it's not punch out at 5 o'clock. When I leave the house at 5 o'clock, they don't go, hey, Terry, how you doing? I drive down the road, they go, hey, there's Hulk Hogan. So instead of saying, hey, what's going on? I go, hey, brother, what's happening? You know? So you've got to give them a little pizzazz. You owe it to the fans. The celebrity status of popularity will change your personal life and business life forever for the good. You have to roll with the momentum. It's good momentum, and you need to learn how to roll with it. I've seen a lot of guys be short with fans, you know, for no reason. I mean, I've been trying to walk to the lobby, and all of a sudden they'll say, my, my kid was playing volleyball at school. I got a phone call one time. I was in the middle of about 100 people. And all of a sudden, I get this phone call from my wife. I pick it up. My son Nick was jumping up at the, the volleyball net on a hardwood floor, and so he took his legs out from running. He hit his head on the ground, and she's on the way there because he's still knocked out. <laughs> well, quick, I told everybody to get out of my way. You know, and as I couldn't explain to him that my son was knocked out at the moment, and the ambulance wasn't there yet. And as I raced in my room to figure out what to do, you know, I had people say, ah, we didn't want your autograph anyway. We don't, whatever. You know, you can't make everybody happy. But I, sometimes I see wrestlers that are good guys. I mean, even if we're going by the old mindset that bad guys don't sign autographs, I don't believe that's the case anymore. But even if we were going by that, the good guys still should sign autographs. I've seen a lot of very popular good guys just blow people off like they don't owe them anything. Um, you owe these fans. Life on the road is tough. I mean, I come from a, a generation of wrestlers where sometimes we were working 60 to 90 days without a day off. You get depersonalized, you become a robot. You go, you have a decision to make. Is it going to be food, sleep, or the gym? Well, I always chose the gym first. Food was second, and the th sleep was the third priority. I probably had everything backwards, but it worked for me because I was the first one to train night and day. Now everybody does it. Uh, life on the road is tough because when you're hurt, it's not like NFL football or basketball or baseball where you get your thumb all the way jammed back and you get to miss a game. You know, if you're in the Philadelphia Spectrum at 1 o'clock in the afternoon and it's sold out and you get your thumb jammed back, well, Madison Square Garden's that night and it's sold out. The two-a-day type situation, or then even the next day. But even more intense is like when you're working two-a-days and you're in the Philadelphia in the Garden. If you get hurt, you can't go in Madison Square Garden in front of 20,000 people and go, oh, we have an announcement to make tonight. Hulk Hogan hurt his pinky. He won't be here. People don't buy it. Wrestlers are like big kids. The pee-pee, poo-poo, ha-ha thing that I've experienced with my children, you know, works in the locker room with wrestlers. My kids do the pee-pee, ha-ha jokes, and still to this day they'll laugh about it. You know, they're 12 and 14 years old, and they'll see something funny or make a joke about it, they'll laugh about it. In the wrestling business, it's a little more serious. You know, Jerry Lawler has a crown, you know. He makes a mistake leaving it in the dressing room. Somebody does number two in the crown. You know, it's, it's pretty tough. You know, Andre the Giant, who's a great friend uh, in Japan, I guess you would call it a rib. Some people would call it necessity. In Japan, they have very small molded bathrooms because the rooms are small and the shower and the sink and toilet are all made out of one mold. I can barely sit on the toilet. I can't fit in the shower because the shower head hits me in the belly button, you know. And so poor Andre, you know, it's, you know, if Andre had to lay the newspaper out on the bed and go to the bathroom, well, there's a poo-poo story for you. But, I mean, that's a rib to me, to see a couple of Japanese maids come in and, you know, think that Mr. Ed just went to the bathroom on the bed. You know, it's kind of hee-hee, ha-ha, poo-poo, but uh, it's kind of funny, you know, stuff like that. A lot of people uh, in my business know that the matches are predetermined, not people, but everybody knows that, the fans know that matches are predetermined and some of the greatest jokes or ribs from this business are sending two wrestlers out to the ring with different finishes. Sending you out the ring saying, I want you to beat Hulk Hogan in 10 minutes and sending Hulk Hogan out the ring saying, we want Hulk to beat you in 10 minutes and seeing two guys fight for their lives out there to try to beat each other. It's, that can be kind of comical. Um, the jokes go on and on. I mean, you know, Harley Race, great friend of mine, all of a sudden you'll be you know, driving kind of fast down the interstate, going 80 miles an hour, you've been driving for four hours, and all of a sudden at 80 miles an hour there's a car behind you pushing you down the interstate. I mean, it's kind of dangerous, but wrestlers are big kids, and sometimes they have fun, and it's not 
very safe fun. The major injuries in this sport are just common. I mean, they're just the common injuries. A lot of people think that wrestling is choreographed. A lot of people think that wrestling is fake. Those adjectives don't work for me. You know, I do see guys talking. I never talk at WrestleMania 18 uh, in the middle of the afternoon. I went to the building at 2 in the afternoon. There were like 10 wrestlers in the ring, walking around in the ring, talking. You know, I didn't say anything to The Rock except, hey, I'll see you out there, brother. You know, that's it. You know, we knew what the finish was, so there's nothing to talk. It's like dancing. You, if you're really good at this and you really know what you're doing out there, you listen with your heart and your ears and what the fans want to see, not what you can try. Because if it doesn't work out there, then you're just another match on a card, not a match that steals the show. Fake means to me that we don't get hurt. Just because the finish is predetermined doesn't mean that what we do in the ring is fake because the injuries are there. You can hit a guy too hard in the back of the neck and pinch a nerve and make his arm go numb and shrink up, such as what happened to Paul Orndorff. Guys break their necks like Chris Benoit. Certain guys have died in the ring because elbows have been dropped and crushed their ribs. Every night I go out there, my main goal is to try not to get hurt. And if the other guy doesn't hurt me, I'm clumsy enough, I end up tripping over my own feet. I was actually waiting for the undertaker or somebody to come to the ring the other night. As I was shaking my arms, I hit my other arm and jammed my own thumb. Ouch, like an idiot. I mean, and I'm not trying to make light of it, but, you know, the injuries are there. I mean, my biceps are torn. All my biceps are torn. My traps torn. When I went to slam Andre the Giant, when I got him here, he was too heavy. And because of 94,000 people in the adrenaline, I went, and I turned him. My whole back from under my armpit ripped and fell down to my waist. I tore my lat muscle, which I never got fixed. So if I was a bodybuilder and I was posing, there's a huge hole under this armpit. The injuries are always there. If I had to give advice to somebody that wanted to get into this business, first off, they need to be possessed with it. It needs to be their every waking thought. And the other thing is, no matter what your situation is, make sure you're ready to give it all up. If you've got a good job, you need to give it up. If you've got a wife, and you've got kids, and you've got family, you need to give that up too. Because it's hard to make it in this business when you're running against people that have it in their blood, second or third generation wrestlers, people that all they have done is dedicate their life to amateur wrestling to get into this business. You gotta kinda be ready to devote everything to wrestling and make everything else your second priority. And then if you are made of that and you can emotionally divorce yourself from everything in this world that you have had and make wrestling your number one priority emotionally and physically, then you might have a chance to make it.